Our commencement speaker is an indisputable hospitality icon. Currently the president and CEO of Las Vegas Sands, one of the world leaders in integrated resort development. He is a veteran in the hospitality field with nearly 50 years of experience and a distinguished and impressive record of success. I'm sure you've all heard the saying, don't sweat the details. I'm pretty sure our guest would strongly disagree with that advice. By one, anyone's definition, he is a hands-on hotel executive. When asked by one interviewer several years back about the biggest challenge Las Vegas Sands was facing in its multi-million dollar Singapore development, multi-billion dollar Singapore development, he said that he was worried on that particular day about a piece of the Sky Park that was being lifted into place that morning. It's a major engineering feat, he said, to get 700 tons of concrete in one slab up to one area, 56 stories in the air, when winds over five miles an hour can hurt it, rain can hurt it, and if it slides the wrong way and hits the building, you've got real problems. So, hands on, yes. He's also an innovative leader, responsible for developing and franchising the Microtel Inns and Suites and Hawthorne Suites hotel brands. His name has also been closely associated with Holiday Inns, Days Inn, and Americana Hotels. Throughout his career, he has served some of the most prominent industry organizations, including the Hotel Sales Marketing Association International. He co-founded the Asian American Hotel Owners Association, which in the past 20 years has grown from 12 members to more than 9,300, who collectively own more than 22,000 hotels, also members with some of our alums. His list of accolades and civic contributions is just as impressive. He has served on the boards of the Marcus Foundation, the American Red Cross, and the Georgia Aquarium. He has received the American Association of Franchisees and Dealers Lifetime Achievement Award, the American Jewish Committee Selig Distinguished Service Award, the UJA Federation of New York Hotel and Hospitality Award, and the Georgia Hospitality and Travel Association Spirit of Hospitality Award. On top of that, he's been named to the HSMAI's hot list of 25 most extraordinary sales and marketing minds in hospitality and travel. And the list goes on and on. You can always hire a chef to cook, he once observed. You can always hire a salesman to, to sell. And you can always find the technological experts. But what you can't find is the generalist who can put all of these things together in an appropriate way to maximize the results. First and foremost, you need very, very good management. That's a prescription that we in the school take to heart, and it's one that our speaker today embodies. And although he's led organizations across the country and around the world, he's a true Bostonian at heart, with degrees from Tufts and from Boston University. Please join me in welcoming back to campus Mr. Michael Levin. An old friend of mine once told me, never follow anybody who's a good speaker because uh, then you got something to do. I, following a student who gave an address like that is a real task to do something better. So uh, forgive me if I'm not as good as he was. Usually when individuals are chosen for commencement addresses, they're expected to impact opinions, experiences and predictions of the future. Sometimes they talk about politics and the usual common discussion of what could be done better. Sometimes they speak to an audience in the hopes that their remarks will make tomorrow's newspapers. Sometimes they add value to their listeners by giving them information that's relevant. And sometimes they give listeners nothing but the hope that the remarks will be short <laughs> and they can move on to celebrate. Hopefully my mission today is not to bore you with platitudes, not to entreat you to work hard, to be good, to make a living, to be charitable, to give back to society, like most, most others will tell you. This day is May 19th of 2012 in the city of my birth, the city that gave my parents and grandparents a home, the city in which most of my immediate family grew up and still live. This is also the city that gave me a public education and two private ones including this one. It's the city within which a company headquartered here gave me my first job, and many thereafter. For you, this day is very special. But I want you to know, for me, 
it is also very special. Just to sit in front of you, the students, the families, the faculty, and the friends, providing remarks that are not that typical, but may be hopefully helpful. Today is the beginning of a new time for all of you. And as my professional time heads towards its conclusion after 51 years, it is also the beginning of a new time for me. So let us share together that mutual beginning or a commencement of what we all will be facing. We are among the world's most privileged, not because we may be financially better, not because we are educated better, not because we have been lucky or unlucky. We are privileged because we are free people. 51 years ago, in my first job, many like us were not. Race, religion, gender, sexual preference were not recognized as equal. And opportunity for all was only opportunity for some. Privilege was relegated to those who fit in. Those who were different were not accepted only because they were different. Perhaps a few examples may be necessary to remind you how far we have come, in spite of the public media's attention that says we have not. Most here are too young to remember, but let me give you a little bit of my history. In December 1946, after World War II had ended, my father, back from Europe, borrowed a new 1946 Chevrolet, the first ones coming off the line after the war, from his brother, and drove my mother, myself, and my grandmother to Miami Beach from Boston. Five days and four motels later, something I saw remains with me to this day. There were signs when we crossed into Virginia on restrooms, white only, water fountains for, quote, colored and for white, and motel signs that said, white only. I was only nine. It was a memory still with me to this day. 1953, seven years later, I am in high school. And my parents, after the summer season at Cape Cod, decide to drive to the Cape to spend a weekend there when the rates went down after Labor Day. I drove by a motel with an outside sign in 1953 that said, white only. No Jews or dogs allowed. In 1955 to 1959, I am at Tufts University, just across the river here. Fraternities are mostly segregated by religion. There are two black girls in the school and two Asians in the class of 1959. I enter law school at the University of Chicago. There is one female, no person of color in the class. In 1960, as a graduate student here at the School of Communications, then called SPRC, I had a part-time job at the Morgan Memorial Home for Boys in the South End. My boss was an African-American PhD from Grambling College, also a football player, about 6'6 and about 280, big guy. And we hired another of the same background to join us. He was looking for an apartment when he moved here from where he came from. I lived in Brookline, about maybe a mile or two from this spot. There was a sign in the window across the street from where I lived on Egmont Street. It said apartment for rent. I told him about it, and he calmly said, they won't rent to me. In 1961, I began work in the sales department of the Roosevelt Hotel in New York City. I am given sales accounts on cards from a now ancient file system called Debold. The accounts are mostly dead. New salespeople get dead accounts, just in case any of you are going to be salespeople, so be prepared. <laughs> and I notice three X's marked on five or six accounts. I ask my supervisor, who describes the accounts as, quote, Negro associations, only to be given space and rooms in July and August when the regular customers aren't there. In 1963, I am offered a job interview in a New York City hotel by a major, a major hotel at that point, until they heard my name. The hirer said over the speakerphone, 
is he one of us? After that, in 1981, I transferred to Chicago. My wife and children and I are riding in an automobile up North Sheridan Road, beside Lake Michigan, with a real estate broker looking for a home for the five of us. And I see a sign. It says Kenilworth. I ask, are there any houses here? I like that town. The answer is, you wouldn't be welcome here. In 1985, I joined Days Inns of America, and I inherit many franchisees of Asian American Indian descent in the business. They cannot get loans, insurance, and equal treatment. Their inns and motels are called curry palaces, and billboard signs on our highways say American-owned, so that guests will avoid their properties. We form the Asian American Hotel Association, we fight the battle, and we win it. There were few females in our business until the 70s and 80s. Look at this class today. I am proud that all that is gone, and we are so blessed to be in one of the most, if not the most, diverse industries on the planet. Today, privilege extends to the many, not just to the few. Today, we acknowledge Lyndon Johnson, a former President of the United States in 1964, when he said the challenge is whether we have the wisdom to use our wealth to enrich and elevate our national life and advance the quality of our civilization. It took a while, but we're almost there. But now that we are privileged by our freedom, do you ever think ahead not only of what to do with it, but what you can do for it? Is there a way to protect it, to nurture it, to grow it, and improve it? Or will this gift that we all have been given be taken for granted? Does anyone here really believe we can lose it? Does anyone ever think it is not permanent? My guess is not too many. We think it will last forever. Freedom helps you, and you can help it. And our ways of ensuring that freedom for all is maintained is by working on it for others, providing opportunities for all, speaking about what is missing and what has to be done, taking risks, because the status quo is a prescription for failure. Our institutions, whether they be government or universities or corporations, nonprofits or profits, must evolve as the need grows, and that involvement requires those of you here in this room must embrace the opportunity to force others and yourselves in whatever you can do to assure the future course of action that will sustain those institutions that we love, or like many of those that have fallen before, so will the ones we care about now experience disappearance. This day, I'm sharing some personal stories, hoping in some way to prepare you for the experiences you will surely have. My journey has been hard. There has been a high mountain to climb, and that climb is not without slips and falls and lacks of oxygen as you climb it. But that climb was not a trip alone. That trip was never on the backs of other people. It is a never-ending constant climb a constant walk in the elements of both success, failure, and trial. I disagree with John Paul Sartre, the philosopher who wrote, man can will nothing unless he has first understood that he must count on no one but himself, that he is alone, abandoned on earth in the midst of his infinite responsibilities, without help, with no other aim than the one he sets for himself, with no other, dest no other destiny, and the one he forges for himself on this earth. My climb was not like that. I was pushed by others. I was helped by others. I was a team guy, a quarterback, a point guard, thrust into leadership, learning early that you cannot win alone, ever. You rise because you are held on the shoulders of others, spouses, parents, siblings, friends, bosses, peers, and teachers all play a role in pushing you up every stage of the Mount Everest of a career of life. 
Sartre was wrong when he said you can count on no one but yourself. In fact, you must count on so many along the way that the numbers will actually stagger you. Find the way to squeeze every ounce of goodness and knowledge out of everyone you meet along life's path because surely it is needed to overcome the challenging bumps along the way. Life has its pains and will always have them. Learn the lesson to take the pain, get rid of the pain by focusing on the gain. Focus on the results at the end, not the difficulty to get there. After all, you are at the end of one stage today. And isn't the satisfaction today much greater than the study of all those finals along the way? <clears throat> you ask, I am starting. What can I do? I urge you, do not fear. In February 1961, I received my first full-time job through the Boston University Placement Department, now called Career Services, when I completed my master's in PR and communications. My salary was $425 a month, and if I stayed 40 years, I was told by the personnel director, you could retire on $40 a month pension. You can't buy, well, maybe a couple of beers today, $40 a month. I moved to New York City to join the Roosevelt Hotel, part of what was to become the Sinesta Hotels a few years later. I was supposed to be a sales promotion manager. I had neither sales experience nor promotion experience. In fact, I had only stayed in one hotel in my entire life, and that was a spring formal. Actually, it was a pretty good spring formal, I must say. <laughs> my job was to change elevator signs, lobby signs, brochures, and collateral material. The job lasted two months, and they pushed me into the sales department. I wasn't qualified anyway, but I tried. The Roosevelt was located at Grand Central Station in New York, for those of you who know the city, at 46th and 45th Street in Madison. And they had a bar. The bar was called the Club Car Bar. It was shaped like a railroad car. It may be still there, for all I know. About 125,000 people walked by that bar every day, in the morning going to work and in the afternoon leaving work. There were two windows in the front of the bar with two vases of fake flowers in them. They were behind glass, actually. I thought it was wrong to have fake flowers in front of the club car bar. I was, I don't know, 24 years old at the time. So I, uh, I looked in the yellow pages mm -hmm. and I found the Lionel Trains office. I went down to Lionel Trains and, and they were in the Empire State Building. And I went to see the sales promotion manager. Actually, he was a real sales promotion manager. And I asked him if he'd give me some trains for the windows. And he said, of course. I didn't realize I could sell the windows at that time. So I gave them away. And two hours later, I had a couple of trains to put in these windows. I got the key from a supervisor. I didn't even realize why the windows were locked because I couldn't imagine anybody would steal fake flowers from a window. <laughs> the next day, the office manager stopped by and said, uh, Mr. Vastias wants to see you. Now, mind you, this is my first job, and I'm in it about three weeks. I said, uh, who is Mr. Vastias? And she said, uh, he is the controller. And I said, what is a controller? <laughs> See, I was a political science major, a theater arts minor. I love history. I studied writing and, and, and communications and PR. I never heard of a controller. I asked the question, what does he control? <laughs> she said, he's an accountant. Many years later, I was at a lecture by Mike Vance, who was a, a famous human resource manager for Disney who gave me the real definition of, of uh, when we were talking about accounting, he said, if Thomas Edison were an accountant, all we'd have today is a longer candle. And so Mr. Vastias represented the long, longer candle community, but I didn't know it at the time. I said, okay, I went to see him, and he was at least 30 years older than I was. And he looked at me over small glasses, because all accountants wore these small little glasses, and whatever, green eye shades, et cetera. And he looked up at me and he said, who are you? I answered, I'm uh, Mike Levin. I'm the uh, sales promotion manager of the Roosevelt Hotel and blah, blah, blah. Said, really? He said, did you take out my flowers? <laughs> I said, yes, sir. 
He said, you know, I put them in there. That's none of your business. I said, sir, I thought it was part of my job. And then he screamed some more things at me, which I can't mention here in this audience. And I left the office thinking that I was going to lose my job, actually get fired. And I couldn't afford it because I was getting married in four months and I didn't have any money. So I was really kind of scared. But I learned something. Change. What is it? It's always, always resisted. Anytime you want to do something different, anytime you want to change something. There are people here that have known me for years and know that battle that I fought and those battles of changing anything were always there. There's always someone who has a stake in staying the same. It was their idea, or even if it weren't, they never want to do anything differently unless it's a crisis. Which is pretty lucky for me because I've had so many crises in the 50 years that I was able to change a lot of things. Not only in business, but in everything. However, without an individual like yourselves, who want to take action, who want to impact, who want to add value, without that individual wanting to make a difference, without an individual standing for the right thing and the thing they believe in, real progress can never be made. Simply stated, it can't be done. Today, as you step onto that big stage of what now, ex now exists, the curtain will rise and the play will begin. And will your part be one that simply garners a simple bow at the end? Or will it be a standing ovation? But only if you want to make it a standing ovation by making a difference. And only if you're willing to take risks to make it happen. A former U.S. Senator, William Fulbright, in a speech given to the Senate in 1964, said the following. We must dare to think unthinkable thoughts. We must learn to explore all the options and possibilities that confront us in a complex and rapidly changing world. That was 1964. It's still applicable today, all these years later. He continues, we must learn to welcome and not fear the voices of dissent. We must dare to think about unthinkable things because when things become unthinkable, thinking stops and action becomes mindless. When I hear the word unthinkable, I think about the words new, different, unusual, experimental. I think about Steve Jobs and Thomas Edison, <clears throat> Alexander Graham Bell and Sabin and Pasteur and Curie and Whitney and Freud. I think about Washington and Lincoln and King, Dao Xiaoping. I think about Thatcher. In our industry, I think about Hilton, I think about Pritzker, I think about Portman, I think about Wilson, I think about Sternlich, and I think about Sheldon Adelson, my present boss. They never think about things unthinkable, only about the possible. I think about Armstrong on the moon, I think about perfect games and broken records and new music and old music, and I think about Picasso and Monet and Michelangelo and Da Vinci, all who did things differently and all who were challenged and fought for what they believe is right in their profession or their talent. And then I look out at you and I ask, who here will take the risks to do the unthinkable? Which of you will challenge your bosses, your peers, your subordinates? Who will lead the industry that has been my life to the next level of guest service and design and taste and uniqueness? Who will challenge the biggest detriment to progress that malignancy that metastasizes from status quo and traditional thinking that continues to make a slow deterioration and ultimate depth. Please look to your left. You can look. Look to your right. Look to the front. You can't in the front row. And look over your shoulder and ask the question, will one of you be one of them? Will all of you do it? Who will enter the workforce and seek to make his or her mark not by conformance, but by challenge and sweat. In the 16th century, Machiavelli wrote something about those who will challenge and those who are not. He said, many have imagined republics and principalities which have never been seen or known to exist in reality. For how we live is far removed from how we ought to live. That he who does not abandon what is done for what ought to be done will rather bring their own ruin than their own preservation. 
His words echo the need of all here to focus on what ought to be done, not to abandon what must be done. Our society cannot move ahead by preservations. Our business cannot move ahead by preservation. It only moves by innovation challenge and a real healthy dissatisfaction for what is. Lastly, a caveat. What happens with success in whatever your endeavor might be? By the way, I'm often asked, often asked how did I get there? What drove you, etc.? I say, I just wanted to do things well in whatever I did. The rest will take care of itself. You are free to choose that gives, what gives you happiness. It's not only money. It's not only station. It's not only things. It's what we are, after all, self-actualization. So we are comfortable with ourselves and where we are, satisfied with what we do by doing well. Fortunate is the man or woman who takes exactly the next measure of themselves and holds a just balance between what they can acquire and what they can use, be it great or be it small. For me, it was never economics. It was the pride of making a difference, the pride of a good marriage, the pride of children, the pride of grandchildren, old enough to realize the values are sound and they are good people. Is that not part of the life we choose to live? But with all that, there are risks. The risk of arrogance, the risk of hubris, the risk of forgetting what brings you there and brought you here, the risk of not appreciating the good fortune and the risk of not sharing whatever largesse you have with those who don't. As you move into positions where others work for you, you must remember that power leads us towards arrogance, that power narrows the areas of concern, that power can corrupt. You, we all, must find a way to remember our limitations. We must remember the richness and diversity of our existence. We must appreciate that stuff that establishes basic human truths and serve us as a touchstone of our judgment as we go forward. There are so many examples in the media today. We ask ourselves, can it change? Can we trust our leaders? Can we feel pride in our political systems, whatever and wherever they may be? And of course, remind ourselves of not our, independ not our independence, <clears throat> but our dependence on those around us. I close this morning with some final thoughts. You have heard me speak of privilege, that you are amongst the elite. You have heard, I hope, me speak of challenge and change and innovation and risk. You have heard me speak of the risks of arrogance so obvious around us. But what, after all, can I say about your hospitality degrees and where they take you? I conclude my wish for every one of you here as you enter a business that is all about people, your guests, your fellow employees, your suppliers, and others. Remember, this is not just real estate, hotels, and hospitality, not just food and drink and banquets. It's a living, breathing, global contribution. It is burdened by imperfections, but with love you can nurture it like a child. <clears throat> it grows up with you. It matures you. And many days it suffers outrageous fortunes with you. It has its pain and it has its gain. But after all is said and done, you have chosen to be a part of an ancient industry that has existed long and will always be there. Throw your arms around it, hug it, kiss it, nurture it, and most of all, love it. For then, it doubtless will return to you more than you give. It may even return to you more than what it has given to me. An experience that has widened my view of the world, that, <clears throat> that truly showed that with every different culture, we humans share very common values. We all wish for the people we care about exactly the same things. That are my wishes here today for all of you. If I could share 50% of my gratitude for what this business has done for me with all of you, it would be my pleasure to know how happy you would be standing here 50 years from now and feel as I do of what the industry has given me. My thanks to you all for listening. You have honored me with your attention. My thanks to those who chose to provide me a podium for my thoughts. 
You have honored my work. My thanks to the families that have sent you on this way. The road is long, but like a rainbow, and end, it ends with happiness. Congratulations to you all. The future is yours. I implore you, take it. Thank you. Thank you.